in conversation with Sri Rahul Ishwar, a well-known panelist on many national channels. The last time I saw him was on the topic of English versus Hindi. Can you give me a couple of snippets on this topic, please? I believe it is never English versus Hindi, even though it was framed like that. It is English plus Hindi. It is never English versus Malayalam or English versus Tamil. It is English plus Indian regional languages. And the great thing about Indian culture is assimilation and integration. And I believe we have internalized English to such an extent that many researchers say in the next 30 years, English is going to be spoken in the way Indians are going to speak it. Because we are having a middle class population larger than that of America's total population. The number of Facebook users, Gmail, YouTube. So English itself is going to have an Indian twist in the coming years. It's a study by many foreign agencies. So it's English plus Hindi and we have internalized English. And if you can use one more sentence, three years back one Indian bought East India Company. Uh, the company which ruled us for 200 years and right now it's an Indian property. In the same way, English is an Indian property and it is high time we use it to our advantage. Are you deciding that government of India has made a mistake in sanctioning the removal of English from uh, the competitive exams? I believe uh, government is yet to decide on, the deliberations are going on, I suppose. Government may uh, concede to some pressure groups as we know. But having said that, uh, English is a global language and language is a growth of centuries. The Germans have tried to propagate their language, the Spaniards have tried to propagate their language. But uh, any language is a growth of centuries and we need not have a blind hatred towards English. Because if you check history, English itself forms a stock of proto-Indo-European languages which is in effect inspired by Sanskrit to a lot extent. So English, in effect, is a brother language of us or sister language of our Sanskrit and our mother tongues. So I believe government should uh, balance between English and Indian local languages. We are all proud to be Tamil, Malayalam, Hindi, um, uh, Telugu, whatever it is. But having said that, there are some realities we cannot ignore. And I believe government won't ignore it. You use the word balance. Tell us a secret. How do you balance between becoming an activist, a panelist, an academician, an entertainer? <laughs> Uh, and uh, potentially a priest. <laughs> and I, I believe life is all about balance. Nature itself is all about balance. You have to balance between different spheres of life. If you, you in your house, you have to balance between your wife and mother. <laughs> I always tell in a light manner with my mother and wife that if I learn to balance them, I can even learn to balance Israel and Palestine. <laughs> so it's all about balancing different aspects. Balancing your individuality is one such aspect. You are having different shades of expression, traits of individuality. You have to balance it. So nature, social life, public life is all about balance. And I believe even our Guruji, Guruji, look at different communities, different nationalities, different races, come to a single person who they hardly have any connection with via roots or culture. And he balances the entire globe or entire people from different countries in a singular a platform. So that itself is a balance we all should learn and we all should be inspired from. You are given, given a good insight on how to balance, but how do you do justice to specific roles that you are expressing through perhaps a reality show, perhaps your activism, so everywhere you have a specific role to play. Yeah. So the word of balancing, how do you differentiate from one role to other? I think they are well defined in their own sense. I had gone to a Malayalam version of Big Boss and happened to be the winner of the show. I never wanted to be a winner. I wanted to go like a prison experiment like in Stanford, uh, they did it. It was a great experience. So when you, are, when you are being in that, you have to be in that, you have to give you 100%. But when you are in a panel discussion or when you are having an intellectual talk like this, you have to go for another mode of your operation. It's the same with us all. When we go to our mother, we are a child. When we go to our spouse or uh, partner, you are a husband or you are a wife. And when we go to our children, we are somebody else. So it's the same individuality manifesting in different forms according to situation and people who you interact with. What is the transformation of your mind that happened post the exposure to reality shows? Um, I, you know, I never had done any entertainment shows in my life till then. I had been in media for the past 10 years. I have been more to the general knowledge or uh, quiz kind of shows, news, panel discussions, debates. It was a refreshing experience. We had some great relationships forming in that place. We had some great friends coming from that place. Great amount of controversies too. <laughs> Earlier, I used to be invited to be a panelist listing about different aspects of controversy, but I myself landed in a controversy when I went there. But it, it was a very popular show, one of the most popular in Malayalam TV history. But we never knew that while we were inside. And I would like to see a positive aspect of saying that it is an amazing experience, 100 days without internet, Facebook, Google, mobile phones, radio, TV, newspaper, anything to read. 
So it's a different experience and we can experience ourselves in a different manner. It was, it's a matter of self-exploration, I would, I would call it. Your lineage has given you extreme exposure to the Shastras and the culture of India. Yeah. Are you able to operationalize some of those Lokas and if so, how? Um, I believe that's a great privilege we as Indians will have. I had a great privilege to study in London School of Economics and I was always proud when I was, I was telling, telling my friends who was coming to Bangalore, every Thursday we used to have a yoga class. A British, a Brit will come and tell, see, it all originated from India and our slokas will be recited. It's a matter of pride and I believe we have such great treasure in the world that no other civilization can claim. But we Indians are shy to claim it. That's one sad aspect I've seen. And the roots, I have studied psychology, especially my research was in consciousness, brain waves and modern ancient uh, Indian wisdom. These are amazing discoveries, our ancient rishis or scientists, whichever way we would like to call it. We can call them philosophers, rishis, gurus, whichever name, whichever brand you call it. So it was a great insight into human mind. And it helped me in my studies in understanding philosophy, psychology. And I can say with extreme pride, a uh, sense of Indianness that many modern discoveries, especially in psychological area, Oh, it's origin to Indian Bodha Shastra or Manas Shastra, the ancient Indian Vedic wisdom. I believe that really helped me in understanding things a lot. Rahul just gave us an insight into operationalizing uh, the Shastra and a combination with psychology. And he uh, merged this with the culture of the land and he claimed it to be Indian culture. But then there are many civilizations currently experiencing civil wars, like in Syria, like in Libya yeah, and uh, <coughs> like in Iraq. So, what is the weakness with the civilization that they have there? Indian philosophy basically says, the greatness of India is the unity of every human being under a single idea or under a single philosophy. We believe in Egam Sat Vipra Bahuda Vadanti. There might be different religions, cults, races. They might have expressed the divinity in different forms. But they are basically the same. Look at Iraq, for example, rightly you pointed out. The same community has subsections and they are fighting in between and they are destroying the places of worship of others. And India is such a land where every coming civilization was granted place of worship by our own kings. So this uh, broad-mindedness is one thing that India has to cherish for world to survive. For example, when you study in the West, you understand there are clashes between two major civilizations and one holy book is being insulted by the other and the other holy book is insulted by this person. And in India, there was a person, Mahatma Gandhi, who said, I have all the four books, Bhagavad Gita, Ramayana, Bible and Quran in my room and it enriches my library, it enriches my understanding of the world. This aspect of understanding the world in the plurality is an Indian concept and India is the last man standing to guard the idea of pluralism. So our culture, Loka Samastha Suhino Bhavandu, is essential for any culture to survive. We have never said India, Indian Samastha Suhino Bhavandu or Bharatiya Samastha Suhino Bhavandu. We said, let the whole world be happy and whatever good thoughts coming from any side, let it be enriched. And I believe Middle East really wants that message. You seem to have been able to operationalize the merger of cultures. But when the competition is in, it is in its pinnacle and one person wants to dominate the other or one culture <coughs> wants to dominate the other and the other culture is resisting subordination and there is an experience of scarcity uh, as differentiated from abundance. In this case of competition, what to do, what is the method to operationalize a merger of culture with a backdrop of competition for limited resources? One promotion of understanding is one very important aspect. Sec re second, regarding resources, there has, there is and there will always be competition. But more than the idea of competition, there should be cooperation. When the clash of civilizations, it's a very prominent idea in the West, came, we all said the clash of civilizations is a reality, but India should always promote a dialogue of civilizations a communication between different civilizations. We, have all, we all have to live in this world. There is no two way about it. We all have uh, some issues about resources. So it is how we learn to share and care between different civilizations. That spiritual, philosophical attitude is very much needed. Otherwise, what we are going to experience wherever in the world in the past thousand years is a clash between different civilizations, uh, different religions, different races. So this should stop at some point of time and some kind of a spiritual understanding, a respect towards all civilization, respect towards different religions, prophets should come. And I, I believe that's India's greatest contribution to the world, whether by in the form of Vivekananda back in 1893 when the world parliament of religions, all religions were trying to compete and say in one way or the other that we are better. 
no, your God is a bad God, my God is a good God. And Vivekananda said, even from ancient times, our people used to say that whichever name you call the great God from or whichever uh, uh, way you articulate, whether you call him Allahu, whether you call him Yahweh, Tao, Brahman, whichever name you call it, you reach the same height, you reach the same consciousness. So that idea is needed and that was emphasized by the American President Barack Hussein Obama when he came to India. He specifically mentioned this incident saying that this young chap from India changed our minds for minds you know, for good for a long time to come. He was mentioning about Vivekananda. So that idea, uh, Indian philosophical understanding is needed for the modern world and Western scientific understanding is needed for us too. So that's the balance we can create. You claimed a transformation from competition to cooperation. Yeah. From the backdrop of psychology, what happens in the mind when one is able to let go of the stubborn stances of competition to merge into cooperation? I think as an aspect of ego is there. As you rightly said, the stubbornness is there, an illogical holding on to one's own idea. Uh, like Gandhiji uses the example of blind men seeing an elephant in different forms and saying that mine alone is right. That's the reason why the Jain philosophy says Sayadwada, Sayadwada as they call it, uh, the manyness of reality, ultimate oneness, but many phases of expression. Even regarding the resources, when you understand that things can be shared, the earth has in its abundance for millions of years to come. It's only that we need to take proper care of it. The earth has everything to satisfy our need, but not our greed, was the words of the man of the century of the past uh, century, Mahatma Gandhi. So this idea of sharing, understanding, living in simplicity, not hoarding resources to such an extent, it will create an artificial gap in the world. So it is a combination of all. And I believe one thought we can give to them is, no need to divide spirituality, no need to divide business, no need to divide politics. It is one and all. It's a one dimension of different aspects of the same reality. When you infuse that spiritual thought into it, everything will automatically become all right. And if one chord goes out of the way, it becomes discord to the whole music. So this thought we can definitely give to the world. What do you see the trend in the future? War of faith or war of ideas? Um, because there's, there seems to be an <coughs> idea popping up everywhere. True. Ultimately, many people want to implement their own ideas. So there's no dearth of ideas. And the, perhaps the competition is to now see whose idea will manifest and whose idea can be demolished. True. true. So do you see in the future an a war of faith or a war of ideas? If I can use another word, it will be a war of paradigms. A different paradigms and different frameworks of understanding the world. If we right now, presently we see there is a broad grouping among different nations with US, uh, the Israel, the European Union on one side, the other bloc being led by China, Russia, uh, the far left as we call it, North Korean nations and the Arab civilizations on the other side. The, I'm not saying this because I'm a patriot or I'm an Indian. Even you look from outside, look at all the global thinkers. They are saying wherever India is leaning, the whole power equations will change. Because we are almost in the middle. We are the centrist forces as they call it. One is a rightist or one is a leftist forces. That centrist force, uh, this war will continue for long. Because there is no point of history where there is no war. But we have to minimize the extent of war, the brutality of it, the savagery of it, the barbarism of war to an extent where there is peace. And that idea should be India's contribution to the world. And if you check the known history of past 3000 years, it's not a claim by Indians. At least for 2000 years, we were leading the world with our GDP. We were the educational hub of the world. And the present day, the world's strongest democracy, America, was discovered by Christopher Columbus, who was in search of India. He accidentally discovered a place called America. So this uh, search for resources, the war of ideas, ideologies, the clash of paradigms will definitely be there. We need a centrist point where we can balance both sides. And India's contribution will be maintaining that equilibrium where there will be maximum benefit for both sides. From the state that you come from, that's Kerala state, you mentioned the word uh, paradigms and ideologies and ideas. Do you see a polarization of ideas, polarization of faith, and polarization of urban versus rural culture in Kerala state? If so, what is the advice you have for a 23-year-old, uh, the young people of Kerala, to have a neutralizing factor between having to polarize, primarily between a rural culture versus an urban culture in Kerala, ideological polarization in Kerala, and paradigm polarization in Kerala? Uh, there are two things. One, regarding youngsters. That's the area we are working on. Uh, we are working on uh, additional skills for 
college teachers and students. It's a government project. Kerala is a very dense state. We are having very large population and very limited area. We cannot have spaces like in Karnataka or say Gujarat or West Bengal to give to big industrialists to come and start industry. This is a very real limitation we are having. Our greatest export is our students. The, uh, the, the skilled youth is the brand ambassador of Kerala. So government, our agencies are all working on education regarding the upskill, upgradation of our youth, especially in rural and of course, there is a divide between rural and urban students, but we are right now focusing on rural schools so that there is a skill upgradation. A responsible Kerala youth should uh, increase his skill, look for the welfare of his community and society, look for the global uh, Indian welfare in the global context too. And he is a brand ambassador and we are going to all the Western nations, the greatest crisis they are having is they are having a dearth of population. They are having almost population growth is nil. Many nations, even including nations like Japan, is a very old nation. India being a very young state and Kerala being a very young state. One good thing about being a Keralaite is uh, when Vivekananda in Chicago uh, said India is a place which accepted all, he in effect was meaning Kerala because the Jews came to Kerala 2500 years back. One of the first Christian community in the world was started by St. Thomas back in AD 52. Uh, the second oldest mosque after uh, uh, Medina was in Kerala, the Kudungalur mosque. A rich cultural diversity is there. But unfortunately, uh, some sections of populations are using this diversity to create discord among society. Uh, unfortunately, 65% of the terror attacks in India were having some kind of links to Kerala is a matter of shame to us. So this polarization is happening. There is no good in brushing it under the carpet. We have to address the problem head on. We have to carry all communities along and to tackle this huge problem. Otherwise, as many people caution, Kerala might be another Kashmir in 25 to 30 years. This is a sad fact being a Malayali, I am being very concerned about. For an average academically interested student, what are the things that can inhibit the student's brilliance? One, uh, his choice is very important. One basic idea that changed in the past 300 years is whole our education system was based on a paradigm by John Locke where he said we are born like white paper and our experience conditions us in the way we are. This was the thought process the whole world curriculum followed for the past 300 years. But with the evolution of genetic engineering, brain studies and psychology, we began to realize this white paper analogy, which we call in beard and embed tabula rasa, is not factual. People are having their own orientation. The modern psychometrics, our understanding of different intelligences or nine sets of intelligences is the modern understanding. I am a person who is verbally a bit good, but I am I'm, I'm very bad at music. My mother really wanted to be a musician, but I don't even understand the concept of ragas. So if my mother is pushing to becoming a musician, I'm going to be a hopeless failure. So we have to identify which are the resources of a person, what all things he are good at. And right now, the age of 14 or 15, we can have psychometric tests or MBITS or FITS or FAC. These are tests which are freely available in Google and Net, but many people are not making use of it. And the greatest limitation is the inability of understanding one or two core competence every individual in the world will be having. That's God's or nature's gift, whichever name you call it. One or two core competences will be gifted by the nature. Somebody will be verbally intelligent, somebody will be a good organizer, somebody will be musically intelligent, somebody will be a good painter, somebody is spatially intelligent, somebody has intrapersonal intelligence, interpersonal intelligence, natural intelligence. This understanding of modern psychology is essential for a parent first. So I would say we should start with parenting, premarital education, then education for youngsters. These three things will combine, will revolutionize the educational scenario and we hope in the next 10 years due to our work it will create a huge change in the state of Kerala at least. Thank you. Uh, finally, Rahul, since you mentioned the word the next 10 years, 10 years from now, what do you see yourself doing? <laughs> um, I had an offer from London to work there. We were working there for almost one year. We had a, a contract with uh, Cardiff University. Their venture whales mentored us. But we wanted to come back to Kerala. We wanted to do something meaningful to India. So I hope we will be in the educational field. Our right now contract is for three years with government training 30,000 teachers. We hope to expand it to at least uh, other states uh, to contribute meaningfully. And when I look back, I can proudly say I have contributed something back to my dharma, my desha and my motherland and feel uh, feel contented with what I have and that will be the uh, 
divine mission which I believe I will be taking in my life. That's Rahul Ishwar with specific plans for the future to contribute to uh, social causes and has uh, is preparing himself to make social impact in the field of education and uh, inter-social relations. We wish him all the best. Thank you for spending some time with us, Rahul. Pleasure.